Welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora on this Sunday when we have the joy of celebrating God's promises to Logan James Daggy in the sacrament of baptism. So glad that you could be with us uh, for this special occasion. The psalmist writes, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Here's Craig Courtney with our introit, Steadfast. The psalmist continues, O God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. 
We come this morning seeking God. Even more importantly, we come seeking the one who is always searching for us. Let's worship God. Scripture reading today is from the book of Luke, chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Hear the word of God. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything, because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, you will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is the word of the Lord.
In the name of the Father and the Son and God's Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. It was not long ago that a friend of mine, in a wonderful moment of honesty, confided that she really doesn't know how to pray. And I confess that I have been thinking about her this week uh, as I worked with our text. Because, of course, the context to today's parable, um, we've been thinking about some of the wonderful stories that Jesus tells this summer. The context for this parable today is Jesus' disciples coming to him and saying, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And Jesus begins, of course, by teaching them sort of the basics of the Lord's Prayer, uh, much the way a piano teacher, a uh, Mary Robertson or a Donna Edwards or a uh, Diane Craig would begin by teaching the scales to their, ser- to their students. But then Jesus knew that the most important thing in any act of prayer is not just how we pray, but to whom we pray. That is the image that we have in our minds when we are praying. More important than do we have exactly the right words or the proper posture or um, are we reading the right devotional material? It's the feelings, it's the image that you have in mind of the one that you are addressing. So, the, so Jesus told the disciples this little parable in an attempt to get at those feelings, at that primal image. Now we've been saying over the last few weeks that all of the images Jesus uses in his stories would have been very familiar to first century Palestinians. And today is no exception to that. You need to remember that back in those days, people primarily traveled by foot. Occasionally somebody rode a donkey. Think of Mary on the way to Bethlehem. Um, But mostly it was by foot. And because of the intense heat in that part of the world, it was not unusual to set out in the late afternoon and then travel through the early evening and arrive at your destination very late, maybe as late as midnight. And of course, there was no extensive system of hotels or motels. Hospitality was really the law by which people lived. It was the only way that common persons could travel. So you had to make plans. Today we will be at Aunt Mabel's house. uh, And then tomorrow night we will be at Uncle George's home. And that's how you made it across the country. And it was expected that when you arrived at a person's house, they would have something for you to eat. There would be water prepared for you to wash your feet. So what happens in this story is that this particular man finds himself with some late night guests, but nothing to feed them. When he got there, the cupboard was bare. And so probably a little embarrassed, he chooses, uh, rather than say to them, you have to go to your bed hungry, he chooses to go next door to see if his neighbor will bail him out. Now, the response of the neighbor at this point is also completely understandable in terms of first century Palestinian life. Again, you need to remember that most of the houses in that time were simply one-room primitive enclosures. There was a single door, there were no windows, there was a dirt floor, most of the cooking, in fact, most of the living was done outside. This particular room would have been nothing but sleeping quarters. So what would happen is that after supper, at some point when it was time for bed, the father would gather in all of his tools. Uh, He would then gather in his animals, his livestock, Finally, he would bring in the children and the family. Then he would go and shut the door. So it is now pretty dark in there. There is nothing but one lamp to illuminate the room. He would get the children situated on the floor. Finally, his wife uh, and he would lie down. And the very last thing he would do would be to uh, put the lamp under the bushel. So now it is completely dark. You can't see a thing. 
And it was really an accepted practice at that time that when you saw that the door was closed and it was dark, you knew the family had gone to bed. You should not be disturbing them. So our embarrassed host comes to the neighbor's house, knocks, finding the door closed, and the first thing he hears is the probably annoyed voice of his neighbor. Can't you read? It says, do not disturb. So let me just pause here and say that I can really identify with this neighbor. I suspect that any parent can. Uh, when I was growing up, um, I could find any excuse possible to push back the bedtime. I needed a drink. I needed to go to the bathroom. There was some really important question that had to be answered that night. There was some story that had gone unfinished. I have this colleague whose son is now fully grown, but when his son was uh, growing up, the father said uh, that he would come home exhausted from the day's work. Uh, he would go through the normal ritual, you know, the, the, the bath time, the putting on of the PJs, the uh, obligatory stories. Finally, uh, it was time for the light to go off, and he would be on his way down for that one precious hour to himself. And as he was leaving the room, his son would say, Daddy, tell me about Jesus. And what, of course, is a pastor supposed to say at that point? My, uh, my colleague said that it took him months to figure out that this was a complete hoax and had absolutely nothing to do with Jesus at all. And so it is that in many a home, there is an 11th commandment. Never wake a sleeping child. Never. Once you get them down, no crisis is sufficient to disturb them. So here is this neighbor, now annoyed, more than a little irritated, but this embarrassed host will not quit. He is now pounding on the door. Finally, the children are awakened, so he, the neighbor gets up, he goes to the cupboard and gets some bread. Notice there is no description of the actual words he says to the neighbor at the door, no, no, no description of the look on his face. So Jesus' disciples ask him how to pray. And Jesus, knowing that the image we have of God is at least as important as the words that we use, he tells them this story. And I have to admit that for decades, it really bothered me. Now, the traditional interpretation of this parable is that we are to be persistent in our prayers. And of course, that's true. But the image of a God locked behind closed doors who has to be battered down and who says, okay, since I can't get rid of you in any other way, I will give you what you want. I mean, that just didn't square with the image of God that I had heard of Jesus in any part of the scriptures. Well, then, some years ago, I came across a translation in Greek uh, of this parable. Remember that the story was originally told in Greek. And there is this little conjunction uh, called kai, K-I-E. And it can be interpreted in a variety of different ways. When it links two things together that are similar, we translate it as and. But when it links two things that are different, so two contrasting ideas, then it is translated as but. And I would suggest to you there is a world of difference between and and but. A therapist once said that if you listen to a person's sentence, if they use the word but, you can pretty much eliminate everything that went before that. I mean, just think about it. Someone says to you, I don't want to be critical, but, or I don't want to take too much of your time, but, I mean, you just lost a half an hour at least. The word but takes the conversation in a completely different direction. It just about cancels everything that went before that. 
And ironically, the turning point of this whole story is that little conjunction, Kai, which in our translation could be translated as and or in some translations as so. In other words, Jesus says, I tell you, though the neighbor will not get up and give anything because the neighbor is a friend, you, because of your persistence, um, will, God will arise and will give you what you need. But I say to you, ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. So am I just splitting hair here? I mean, you know, let's be honest. This is just a Greek conjunction, right? I don't think so. Because I honestly believe that the image Jesus is giving us in this parable is not the way Jesus is, but rather represents our mistaken image of God. The fear we have deep down inside of us, ever since in the beginning, the serpent said to Adam and Eve that God cannot be trusted. God really doesn't have your best interest at heart. And therefore, you better just look out for yourself. It's every man for himself in this life. If you are familiar with paganism, the literature of paganism, uh, you know that the basic assumption of paganism is that the gods in heaven, the powers that be, are at best disinterested or indifferent to our lives. You remember the old myth of Prometheus. Prometheus was one of the lesser gods in the Greek pantheon. And the story says that one day Prometheus was looking down from wherever the gods live, and Prometheus saw some human beings stumbling around in the dark, freezing cold, and had compassion on them. So he went and he took some of the fire from the altar of heaven and he gave it to the human beings so that they could be illumined and warmed. Well, in the myth, the king of gods finds out what Prometheus has done and is absolutely furious. So he sentences Prometheus to a life chained to a rock with vultures eating out his insides. And why? because he has broken the cardinal rule of actually caring about those creatures down on the earth. You see, it's sort of a picture image of this pagan idea, this basic fear that deep down, the ultimate powers in the universe don't really care about us. I think this is the reason behind the whole system of sacrifice in primitive cultures. I mean, has it never bothered you that there are all of these grotesque rituals, people sacrificing uh, to the gods the things that are most precious to them? They're animals. Or they're children, um, mutilated and offered up as sacrifices. And why? In order to get the attention of the gods in order to send up this sweet savor so maybe they won't be angry with us. Maybe they won't even be indifferent to us. Maybe they will actually notice us. So this neighbor behind the door was asleep. He has no sympathy. He only does what he does begrudgingly. And he represents this pagan fear that I would suggest to you is still alive in millions and millions of people today. Unless you are very different from me, I would suggest that it lives somewhere in you. Be honest. When you hear the words, the will of God, and you apply that to your life, do you immediately jump with joy and overflow with happiness? Or is there a part of you that wonders, if I really turn over control of my life, what will that be like? What will I have to give up? Will I actually be worse off than I am today? C.S. Lewis tells a story about a little boy who was asked by his Sunday school teacher, what do you think God is like? And the boy responded, I think God is like a great killjoy. 
He walks around with a frown on his face. He's like a cosmic policeman. And if he finds anybody having too good a time, he puts a stop to it as quickly as he can. God, the great killjoy. Now, in all honesty, is there a part of that that relates to you? I mean, I know we don't believe it up here. I'm talking about down here. John Claypool, who was one of my favorite Episcopal preachers, uh, talked about how when he was a little boy, they used to have missionaries who would come to visit their church. He said they were always shabbily dressed. They never had a touch of joy on their face. And they would always talk about surrendering your life to God's will. Well, I mean, surrender is not exactly a popular word in our vernacular today. John said as as a little boy, all he could think of was, if I ever surrender to God's will, I'm going to find myself in some God-forsaken place, dressed as poorly as this guy and probably not having enough food. I am never sending up the white flag. Now, if that connects with you in any way, this kind of fear deep down, that the one who is really behind it all cannot be trusted, doesn't really have your best interest at heart. I want to say to you this morning, the one who brought you into this world loves you more than you love yourself and knows the secret of joy better than anything you will ever concoct. And living into that truth is the surest way to drive out any fear and enable you to face any situation better than you could ever do all on your own. But I say to you, ask, you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock on the door of God, it will be opened. You see, what Jesus is saying is that we have been wrong ever since the serpent tried to convince us to mistrust God. And so, Instead, Jesus gives us this other wonderful image of a God as a loving parent. Now, I know that there are abusive parents. There are parents who misuse their power. But if you can take the most perfect image of parenthood or grandparenthood with all of our hopes, all of our dreams for our children... And you can then multiply that exponentially. That's what Jesus says God is like. That's what God wants for us. And when you know that you are approaching a love like that, a love that is already there, that is not indifferent, but one that has your best interest at heart, that makes all the difference when you are praying. The words don't really matter. And I need to add a little addendum here because I want you to know that Jesus did not say something that many children say to their parents. Notice, children often say, if you really loved me, you would give me all of these things. Jesus did not say, if you ask, you will get everything that you want. He did not say that. He said, ask and you will receive. The Father will give you the Holy Spirit. In other words, when we approach God with our wants and our needs, we are entrusting those requests to a source that knows infinitely more about what we really need than we do. One of my favorite stories from church history is a story about St. Augustine and about his relationship with his father and mostly with his mother. And you may remember that his mother, Monica, was a devout Christian woman. His father, on the other hand, was just as zealous in the opposite direction. He was shamelessly greedy. He went regularly to the Roman baths. Uh, The family lived on the northern coast of Africa. And Augustine, in his early life, 
followed in his father's footsteps. He too went to the Roman baths. He fathered a child by the age of 18 uh, out of wedlock. This is one of the great saints of the church, incidentally. He was involved in all kinds of sensuality. However, he was also brilliant artistically. He majored in what was at the then called rhetoric, which I suppose would be like majoring in theater uh, today. But because he was so gifted, he had pretty much exhausted all the resources available to him there in North Africa. So his real dream was to go to Milan, to Italy, which was the source of, of all good rhetoric at that time. I suppose it would be like you know, wanting to go to New York to make it on the stage or, or going to f Hollywood to make it on the big screen. Well, his mother, Monica, uh, grieved over all of this. She prayed every day that uh, Augustine would come to his senses, that he would come to Christ. And one evening, she was praying right there on the northern coast of Africa in a little chapel, praying that uh, uh, Augustine would not go at the very same time that Augustine was getting on a boat and heading to Italy. It was sort of like Jonah getting on the boat and heading in the exact opposite direction that God was wanting him to go. Well, when he finally got to Milan, he was told that the finest practitioner of rhetoric in all of Italy was a man named Ambrose, uh, the bishop who would preach every Sunday at the cathedral in the center of town. He, they said to him, now, you don't have to pay attention to what he says, but how he says it is masterful. And so, without any inkling of anything more, uh, Augustine began to attend services at the cathedral. And lo and behold, Ambrose turned out to be the person in all of the world who was best equipped to speak not only to his emerging talents, but to his heart. And through the preaching of Ambrose, uh, Augustine experienced a profound conversion and, as you know, became one of the leading theologians of the Middle Ages. When he was writing about uh, his reflections about how God had been involved in his life, it's called the Confessions, he talks about that night when his mother was praying so earnestly in that little chapel on the northern coast of Africa. And he says, on that night, God, out of his incredible goodness and wisdom, denied Monica the form of her request so that eventually God could grant her the content. In other words, that night, Monica did not get what she asked for. Sort of reminds me of Garth Brooks' wonderful country song, Unanswered Prayer. God did not give her what she asked for, but God brought Augustine to a place that she would never have been able to. She didn't even know who Ambrose was. Jesus says, if you who are imperfect know how to give good gifts to your children and grandchildren, how much more will God do for you? In other words, if you trustingly open yourself to God, God is going to give you the best that God knows how to give because God is love. In him there is no darkness. So this tricky little story designed to help, help us remake our image of God as the trusted one, as the one who knows what is best for us. That's the promise that God is making this morning to Logan James in his baptism, the promise that God made to you. To the mystery of God, Jesus gives a face. On that face, he puts a smile. Amen. Let us pray. Seeking God, you are the beginning and the end of our search. You are the Alpha and Omega 
of all of our discovery. You are the voice and the silence of all of our explorations. Giving one, you are the fullness and the emptiness of all of our yearning. You never abandon your search for us, persistent one, nor tire of our repetitive toings and froings. Receiving one, you endlessly welcome us home. You spread before us a feast in the face of our constant requests for mere morsels of bread. Search us, O oh God, and find within us the secrets that we hide. Ask us, O oh God, and receive from within us the pain that we bear. Keep knocking at the door of our lives until we open our wills to your purpose, our lives to your life, our yearning to your hope. When we forget to seek you or discover that we have lost our way, Lord, have mercy. When we ask once and just leave it at that, Christ, have mercy. When we draw back from knocking, Lord, have mercy. Strengthen our courage, bolster our endurance, so that we may speak your justice, so that we may live your love. Hear us now as in a few moments of silence we lift before you our own joys and concerns. And now, loving one, gather all of these together into the one prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We come now to one of the truly joyful times in our worship and in the life of our community as John and Carrie have brought their child to be baptized this morning and he is very ready to participate. Um, great to have a proud grandma, Carol, here uh, who has already lit the baptismal candle and Suzanne who is here representing you as the congregation and who has a long history with the uh, Daggy and Cosgrove family. Uh, we have a rose here representing a very proud grandpa who we think is also smiling and looking down on us uh, this morning. So welcome to this wonderful celebration. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you to the close of the age. Obeying his words and sure of his presence with us, we baptize those whom God has called to be his own. In Jesus, God has promised to forgive our sins. He has joined us together into the family of faith, the church. He has delivered us from darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Know that the promises of God are for you. By baptism, God puts his sign upon you to show that you belong to him. And he gives you the Holy Spirit as a guarantee that sharing Christ's reconciling work, you will also share his victory. That dying with Christ to sin, you will be raised to eternal life. Friends, in presenting your child for baptism, you are announcing your faith, and so I ask that you give answer to the following questions. Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you? I do. Do you trust in him? I do. I do. do you intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized, believing the journey of faith to be not a solo adventure, but a journey we make together. We, the people of the church, promise to tell this disciple, this child, the good news of the gospel, to help him know all that Christ commands, and by our fellowship, to strengthen his family ties with the household of God. So, Logan, will you come to me? Can I say hi? Oh, are you so big now? <laughs> and you're so big? Are you so big? What is the name of your child? Logan James Daggy. Logan James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. You are adorable. <laughs> Thank you. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life, you have called us by name and pledged to each of us your faithful love. We pray for your child, Logan James. Watch over him. Guide him as he grows in faith. Give him understanding and a quick concern for neighbors. Help him to be a true disciple of Jesus Christ, who has baptized your son and servant, who is our risen Lord. God of grace, we pray for parents John and Carrie. Help them to know you, to love with your love, to teach your truth, and to tell the story of Jesus to their child so that your word may be heard and bring about plans for us that you have promised. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. 
So normally, look at you smiling, look at you <laughs> smiling. I know, I know, I know, I know. Normally we would ask you at this point to take a walk around the congregation and everyone would be welcoming Logan to the family of God. But since we can't do that, instead we have a quilt, a handmade quilt that we would like to present to you. It was made by Nancy Youngerman and uh, intended for you and we have permission to do that. So we hope that you will wrap Logan in it as we wrap our prayers and our love around him as well. And there is also a book um, that is coming also um, from Nancy as well. So I'm going to invite you now at home um, to conclude the, today's service with our baptism hymn, um, which we will be singing each in our own homes. Thanks for being part of this part of the service. Go out into the world in peace. Live as free men and women. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Spirit among you. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you, today and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>